We are in Chodesh Nisan, we're still there, and uh, therefore one can talk about Pesach, because the divine energy or force that comes down in, because of Pesach is still active. In fact, what's interesting about Pesach, you know, we have Sukkot, Sukkot has the first days, then it has a Cholamoyed, Right? And then it has the last days. Well, Pesach also, it would seem that Pesach has the first days. Then it has Cholamoid. And then it has uh, the last days. You know, Shri Shil Pesach. And the last day of Pesach and so on, you know. But what's really interesting is that <clears throat> that's not really how you should look at Pesach. Because Pesach, the first days of Pesach, is the first days of the holiday. And then, from the second day of Pesach, all the way to Shavuos, is the Cholamoid. Because they're all connected, you see. And then Shavuos is the last day, in a certain sense, of Pesach. So, and the reason for that is the theme is very similar to both Shavuos and Pesach, which I'm going to talk about. But that's an important idea, that Pesach does not end in the last day of Pesach, Achron Shal Pesach. It really continues all the way to Shavuos, right? And the proof of that is that we count the Sphira. We count 49 days, right? And then Shavuos, right? So what that shows you is that there's clearly a connection between Shavuos and Pesach, which means that the divine energy that comes down continues until Shavuos, you see? So therefore I can certainly talk about Pesach because that will include the whole discussion or all the ideas about what's called the Yemeha Sphira, the days of Sphira counting, and also Shavuos. So that's an important idea to keep in mind, you see. <clears throat> so as such, therefore, uh, I gave the previous two shurim, part one and part two, but I never, never really completed the concepts of Pesach completely, and also to talk about uh, the severe days, which ends in Shavuos. And that gives you a totality of everything that's going on in Pesach from a spiritual and Kabbalistic framework. And that's really what you have to have. So therefore, I'm going to continue speaking about Pesach, because we're really still in the midst, in, in the, we are still in the, in the mid zman, as they say. Because the shefa, the shefa means the divine influence or force that comes down, continues to come down until Shavuos. So it doesn't stop just because Pesach is over, you see. So like I said, you know, the first days of Pesach is Yom Tov. Then there's a Chalamoid, which is 49 days long, starting on the second day of Pesach, right, the 16th day of Eir, because in Israel there's only one first day of Pesach, and then the second day already is Chalamoid. And that continues, this concept of Chalamoid continues all the way to Shavuos. And on Shavuos, which is the 50th day, right, that's when you have Kabbalah Satura, and that is the termination of the Shefa. And the reason why it's a termination is because Shavuos actually ends with the conclusion, and the, I should say, the successful conclusion of Pesach, the whole idea and so on, you know. <clears throat> Now, I had uh, ended last, last year about Pesach 
uh, and we talked about the Brisbane Absarum, the covenant between the pieces, where the Rabbanu Shalom spoke to Avram Avinu. And therefore, as such, he made a covenant, an agreement with him, that he and his nation, they have to do the job of tikkun, means to rectify creation. And I told you what rectification is, which is a very important idea. It's to change the world. The first stage of rectification, since the sin of Adam Harishan, the first man, is to do what? Is to remove the Zoyama, that contamination or pollution of the Sutton, because that's what happened when Adam Rishon sinned. So to remove it, and then the world becomes physical, you see, without Zoyama and without Sutton, we know, right? Because that's what Adam Rishon sin introduced, the satanic power over the physical universe. So once that's removed, then we are now into a purely physical universe without any satanic influence. And then I had mentioned, we know, that you go from the physical universe, which is really the messianic era, it's really what it is, without Zayama, and that goes into a spiritual universe, right, where we everybody is, and then from the spiritual universe, you go into a divine universe, which is Oedem Habo, you see. So that really is the panorama of the whole job of Tikkun, you see. So we now know, right, that the Jews went to Egypt in order to remove what's called the sparks of holiness that were trapped by the Sutton and therefore given to Egypt, you see, because of all of the sins of mankind previously. So the Jews had to, the, had to do the tikkun, which means not only to bring down the energy of the spheres to change the world, but the Jews had to take out the sparks of holiness, right? Which is the sparks of divine energy that are in the spheres. They had to take them out of the, of the domain of the Sultan, you see. And that job was given to them because of the Brisbane Absarum, uh, and that they, they had to rectify creation. So, so far we know this. So therefore they had to go to a place, which turned out to be Egypt, that they could take back, and that, and that place, which like I say turned out to be Egypt, is what's called the Bechor, the firstborn of the Sultan, you see. And originally, it was the firstborn in a family that had the responsibility that a coin, a, uh, you know, a, a coin has today. That was the original intent. And then it changed after the, the uh, Cheto Egel, the sin of the golden calf. So therefore, the concept of a Bechor is a concept of the individual, of an individual that really possesses the responsibility, right, to do whatever job he is assigned. So therefore, the Bechor of the Sultan is Egypt. That's who the Bechor of the Sultan is. And what is interesting is that the one who began to take out the sparks of holiness from Egypt, which is the Bechor of the Sultan, the firstborn of the Sultan, it has the energy, you see, was really Yosef HaTzadik. Because Yosef HaTzadik was in Egypt, right? And the reason why he went to Egypt is that he, because he is a root soul, obviously, of the Mashiach ben Yosef. So his job really is to begin taking out a tremendous quantity of the Nitzotei Kedusha, the sparks of holiness from the land of Egypt. Because this is really what the real story is. You see. Uh, so he did that. He was tested for 13 years. He was in prison in Egypt. And he had to withstand all the, trem the tremendous temptations that Egypt offered. Because Egypt was a land 
steeped in hashchosa, in corruption, uh, and, and so on, especially zimo, which is sexual perversion. But in any case, and he had to stay there for 13 years and withstand the, the, the influence of Egypt. And if he did that, what would happen is that he would take out a great deal, not all, but a great deal of the sparks of holiness, right, that nurtured Egypt because it nurtured the Sultan. Because remember, the Sultan eats from that. That's where he derives his power. <clears throat> so this, therefore, is what Yosef HaTzadik did. And his main test, which I'm going to elaborate, not now, but later on, um, whatever, his main, ta- his main uh, task, and therefore the main test, was the story of he and Fatifa's wife, that he withstood her temptations, and he was successful, and therefore he it, it tremendously depleted the sparks of holiness in Egypt. In fact, that is eventually what got him out of prison. Because if you remember, he interpreted the dream of Paroi, that there would be seven years of plenty, then seven years of famine, a terrible famine, you see. And the reason why, so Pharaoh had that dream, of course, and, and uh, Yosef was called to interpret that dream. Uh, I'm not going through the whole story. And that's what got him out of prison, that he interpreted the dream. But what is interesting in that story, you see, is why did Pare have that dream? Because that was going to be the future, that Egypt would have to suffer a tremendous uh, 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 fat, uh, uh, fast or, uh, you know, uh, an absence of food and so on. Why did Pare have that dream? Because what Yosef had succeeded at that point is taking out the tremendous amount of sparks of holiness, not all of it, but a great deal from Egypt. That meant that the Sutton is starving because that's how he lives. That's how he gains his power, his energy. But wait a minute. If the Sutton is starving because Yosef took out by passing the test if the Sultan is starving because he has much less sparks of holiness than his firstborn, because those these guys, Egypt, right, are agents of the Sultan, so therefore they also starve. You see, so Paroi, who is the king of Egypt, right, would dream about something that affected his kingdom, because he represents that, because he's the king of Egypt. You see, so Paroi had a dream that there would be plenty and then famine, right? Because Yosef had succeeded in de- depleting an enormous amount of food from Egypt and creating a famine. So it comes out that Yosef created a famine, you see, that forced Paroi to dream that eventually they tapped Yosef to interpret it and then he got out. He was the one who created the famine. See, that's really what it represents on a mystical level. You see, now what is also fascinating is Yosef now appears in front of Paroi, right, interprets the dream. And then Paroi says something very strange. He says, well, I see that you're tremendously wise, right? So I'm going to make you the second in command the highest position in Egypt after me, the Grand Vizier. And you are now going to be the Grand Vizier. Uh, so the question that we always ask is why? Yosef basically was a prisoner that was released. Okay, so he's released, right? And you give him a reward because he's a consultant. He's a dream interpreter. You don't make a guy like that Grand Vizier because he interpreted the dream. So why did Pari make Yusuf HaTzadik the Grand Vizier? That makes no sense. But the answer is a very profound concept, you see. <clears throat> because this world must reflect the balance between the Sultan 
and the Jews. Who has the majority of the sparks of holiness? And whoever has it has the power in, in, in this world. But since Yosef took out so much sparks of holiness, he severely diminished and depleted, you see, the sparks of holiness in Egypt. So therefore, the balance has to reflect that. So therefore, Yosef took out so much that vis-a-vis Egypt, he now became the Grand Vizier. You see? Because most of the sparks were now in the hands of the Jews. You see see how it works? So that's a barometer. What happened to Yosef is the barometer that he had succeeded to an incredible extent of depleting Egypt and therefore creating the famine. So much so that he became the Grand Vizier. You see, what do we see from this? That Yosef did an incredible job. And he did this by remaining righteous. Because that's how the Jews do it. If a Jew remains righteous and he defies the temptation, then he succeeds in taking out what's called the Nitzvah Kedusha, the sparks of holiness. You see, he actually takes it out and it's given over, it is restored back into the hands of Kedusha, the side of Kedusha. You see? And that's what Yosef did. But that's also why the Jews went to Egypt. Because they had to take out the rest of the sparks. Because Yosef, as we will see, as a half a patriarch, which we will see later, he was able to take out an enormous amount. But what is fascinating is it wasn't all of it. The Jews now had to go to Egypt and take out the rest. It's a very important concept. That's why they went to Egypt. So, in the beginning, they went to Egypt, and their job was to remain Gerim, aliens, which means don't assimilate in Egypt. But they did. So therefore, God used a second mechanism of Tikkun, which is suffering. You see? And if you recall, that's what he said to Avram Avinu. They will be there hundreds of years, right? They'll be Gerim, right? Which means they will be aliens, which means they will not assimilate. But what happens if they do assimilate, right? So they'll be Gerim first, and then Vavodim, they will serve them. See, that's the beginning of the service, the slavery. And if they continue assimilating, which they did, then they will suffer, you see, the Inu Oisam, then Egypt will cause them to suffer. So therefore, suffering is the major mechanism. It is the third and last mechanism that can remove the sparks of holiness, right, to do the Tikkun. And uh, this is eventually what happened in Egypt. When the Jews remained in the beginning, they were able to remain aliens, you see. Then they fell into Avod Zara, right, and as a result of that, they became involved with the Hashchosa, the Hashchosa, the corruption of Egypt, you see. And as a result of that, they were enslaved. And then they fell further, so the Egyptians began to persecute them, right? To enslave, not only enslave them, but to persecute them. So this is basically what the Jews are doing, all in the service of trying to get the energy source of Sutton, which is the sparks of holiness that come from the spheres, right? The Jews were trying to get that out of Egypt and therefore restore the world, remove this Zoyama, because that's what happens. If you remember what I said, right? Uh, that if you remove the sparks, what happens? Then the Sutton collapses. He dies. Because without those sparks, he cannot survive. Not only that, but if he collapses, so does his power. So the zoyama, the pollution or the contamination, that collapses. You see? So eventually he dies. And the world turns purely physical. And that is the messianic era. Uh, Now, 
the Jews, did they succeed in doing this? And the answer is yes. For the first time in history, the Jewish people, right, succeeded in taking out all the sparks of the Sultan. Everything. Which obviously put the Sultan in a terrible, precarious position. So therefore the Jews, and the Gemara says this, that when the Jews stood at Har Sinai, right, the Zoyama was removed. Right, they were, the Gemara says that they were equal in spiritual stature or in spiritual position to other Mauritian before the sin. But Adam Marish before the sin had no Zoyama in him. Because I had mentioned then that the Satan was external to the body of man. And when Adam sinned, he fell into the physical universe that was inhabited by the Satan and all the four levels of Klippa, which I had mentioned. In any case, the Jews were equal to Adam at Batan Terra, right? Because they had removed the Zoyama. And now they were ready, right, for the Messianic era. But that did not occur because of the sin of the golden calf, which I will speak about. But in any case, so therefore we now begin to see, uh, the, let's take a look at the Chumash, where in Shemois, where it says, Vayi onchu, and the Jews groaned from the Avodah. And then it says, that God knew. What does that mean? He knew that the end had come. Now what's the connection between them? The Jews groaned from all the terrible punishment, the persecutions of the Egyptians. And then it said God knew. Vayedalokim, and God knew. Because Tur is pointing out that the major mechanism that they were using to remove the sparks for the last 80 years of the exile was the suffering that the Jews had. So therefore, Vayeonchu, they groaned, and apparently that was the last amount that was needed. And then, Vayeonchim, God knew the time had come to take the Jews out, because the Jews were now complete. They were complete with the, the mechanism of suffering, and therefore he would now take them out. So the next parasha, we read the snare, which is the burning bush which when you think about it, is really amazing. That's an encounter between God and Moshe Rabbeinu. And which is a, really, when you think about it, it's incredible. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking to God, right? Consciously. And he's awake. So the first thing God says, you must take the Jews out. You see? So Moshe Rabbeinu, which I pointed out, said something very interesting. He says, I can't take them out. Because... The reason why they're in there is because the fact that they worship idols is known to the Sultan. And therefore, he's Makatreg. He uh, prosecutes them, you see, because the Jews speak Lashon Hara. And when somebody speaks Lashon Hara, right, what happens? Then automatically, there's a Kitrug. There's a prosecution because you speak Lashon Hara, which I had mentioned, you see. Uh because it's a measure for measure. You speak Lashonara, you condemn, so therefore the Satan has the ability to condemn you, which of course is a prosecution. So Moshe Rabbeinu said to God, but they speak Lashonara, and therefore the fact that they worship idols, right, is known to the Satan. So then how in the world can you take them out, since there's a tremendous amount of Kitrugim? So God said, no, they do not speak Lashonara anymore, and therefore this is concealed from the Sutton, you see. And as a result of that, they can now go out. In fact, I told you that the Medrash says three times in the Medrash that the reason why the Jews got out of Egypt, right, is because they stopped speaking Russian horror. And that's why God gave Moshe Rabbeinu a sign. He said, put your hand inside your coat, and you put it in, take it out, it became Saras, you see, which a person gets because of Lashonara. And then God said, take it again, put it in, which he did, took it out, and it was cured. And that was the sign to Moshe Rabbeinu that the Jews stopped speaking Lashonara.
because the Taras left. In any case, then the Rabbi Shem said to Moshe, I want you to take the Mata, the staff of God, right? And what is the staff of God? The staff of God, right? Take it and throw it down. And he did, and it became a snake. Then the Rabbi Shem told him, bend down, take the, sta- the snake in your hand, and lo and behold, it became, it became a staff. What was that? <clears throat> because the Rabbanishim was telling us, now we know that the power source of the Jewish people are the sparks of holiness, and also it's the power source of the Satan. Both of us, we and the Satan vie for the same power source. You see? Both of us have the same power source. So what the Bansham did is he had Moshe throw the Mater, right, which represents the power source, and he became the Sultan. So what the Bansham was telling Moshe Rabbeinu is that the power source gives rise to the Sultan, and therefore your staff, which represents the sparks, has now turned into Nahash, the snake, you see, because that's how the snake survives. But then the Bansham said, but it is now different. Bend down, take it, and the staff turn back, right? I should say the snake turn back into the staff, and that indicated to Moshe uh, that there is no longer sparks in the hands of the Sultan. It's all back in the hands of the Jewish people. And that's incredible. That means there is no more sparks in Egypt. And therefore, Basically, the Sutton is powerless, and Egypt is now powerless, you see. And therefore, you now can take them out. That's what the Bershom was telling Moshe Rabbeinu. You see, that was the sign of the staff and so on. So that's what Moshe Rabbeinu did, right? He goes to Paroi, and he throws down the staff, right? And the staff uh, becomes a snake. To indicate to Paroi that you have no more power because your being, the Satan, is now powerless and therefore you fin- you're finished. You see. Now, what does that mean? What was therefore going to happen? Well, what was going to happen is that since the power source of the Satan, which is all his sparks, is now back in the hands of the spheres, then the spheres, ten of them, are now energized, right? Because they now have tremendous addition of sparks, and they will destroy Egypt. The ten spheres made into physicality, that is the ten makas, you see. And there's a direct parallel between the makas, which are the the um, the uh, plates and the ten spheres are connected conceptually, so that's really what it is, and that's mida connected mida. The Jews had removed the, the power source of the sultan, and they were restored to the spheres, and these ten spheres were now going to become physical or their physical manifestation, and that would destroy Egypt, and that's a measure for measure. Isn't that interesting? And that's why there are four ideas which are parallel. The first idea which is parallel, right, is the where it says, Asura Mamoris, with ten sayings God created the world. In Pirkei What are those ten forces, or rather ten say, uh, sayings? Those are the ten spheres. And those are identical, right, to the uh, spheres, and those are identical to the ten makas, because the ten spheres is what destroyed the Egypt, Egypt in, a, in a physical form. And because of that, the Jews were given a tremendous reward, which is the ten commandments. You see, they're all ten. The ten mamaras, which are the ten sayings, are really identical to the t- ten spheres, which is identical to the ten makas, which is identical to the Ten Dibras, the Aseris of Dibras. And there's an exact conceptual connection between all of them. Any case. 
So therefore, this is what the Baruch Hashem is telling him by the snare. You see, and that's exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu does. In any case, so therefore Moshe begins the process, you see, of bringing the energy of the spheres to destroy Egypt. Now, what's interesting is the Egyptians didn't really know in the beginning how is Moshe Rabbeinu pulling this off? You see, they didn't understand that. So initially what they thought is that they're doing it with the power of Kishuf. You know, it says nine carbon of the ten that were given to the world, nine measures were given to Egypt. Kishuf, magic, comes from the power of the Sultan to alter physical reality. So I'm not going to go into the, what, what, exactly how it works, but Kishuf really is energized by the Sultan, and the, the Egyptians were very good at it. Very good, you see. Uh, so initially they thought, well, that's really the only real source of magic. And they knew this magic. So they looked at Moshe. How in the world is Moshe? How did Moshe make the Nile River turn into blood? Could you believe the Nile River turned into blood? Real blood, not colored water. So they thought that, you know, they know the power of Kishuf, magic, and how to get the Sutton to alter the physical world, because that's really what magic is, you see. And Moshe Rabbeinu knows. The only thing is that Moshe Rabbeinu, he's a full professor of magic, so he's much greater than they are in magic, because they thought that the mechanism that they use is identical to the mechanism that Moshe Rabbeinu used, you see. Until they got to lice. And the rule is that magic, if it comes from the Sutton, cannot work on anything that's less in size than a barley grain. It can't work, you see. But wait a minute. Lice is smaller than a barley grain. So they realized something which was shocking, that the power source of Moshe Rabbeinu has nothing to do with the Sutton. And it's not Kishuf, you see, the way they use it, you see. So then they realized that the power source of Moshe Rabbeinu is God, is divine. So therefore they said, Etzpa Elokimhi, this is the finger of God. They realized that Moshe Rabbeinu somehow knows and has access to this incredible power source. And that's how he's doing it. And they have no idea how to do that, you see. So it's really a divine energy, which is completely different than the way they do it. Because Moshe Rabbeinu was able to produce lice, which is smaller than barley grain, which they could not do. And that's really a very important idea um, that they realized. And what is interesting also is it says, Etzba Kimhi, that it is the power source of God. You see, the finger of God. And if you ask yourself, why do we have ten fingers? Because God has ten fingers. His fingers are the spheres. And there are ten of them. And since man is a model of divinity, then he imitates divinity. So just like God uses ten fingers, which are the ten spheres, right, to manipulate, to interact with the world, so also man uses his ten fingers, you see, to interact with the world. And therefore, they call um, the finger of God, you see, because they recognize that his mechanism, right, is the, um, the power source of God himself. You see, now what happened therefore is that the firstborn of Egypt, right? Who are they? The, Egypt is the firstborn of the Sutton. But since, they, and the reason why, because they have all the sparks of holiness more than the other nations. But since now the Jews, but now since the Jews now have the power source, the sparks of holiness, right? 
then they are called the Bechor. And that's really what happened. God changed, you see, the title of firstborn. He changed it, and God says, Bechuri, my firstborn, because they now have all the sparks of holiness, right? They are now my firstborn, right? And as a result of that, I'm taking away the status of a firstborn from Egypt, because basically what it is, right, is that Egypt, like I said, being the fact that it has the sparks, you see, automatically, uh, they lose their status of firstborn, it is now transferred to the Jewish people. And that's the meaning of the uh, the Makas, the uh, the uh, Makas Bechiris, where God killed them. Because what he really did is he indicated that the firstborn is now the Jewish people. And the Egyptians have lost their status as per firstborn, you see. And therefore, God is going to kill all the firstborn of Egypt because they do not have the firstborn status anymore. You see, so that's why you have the Makas Bechiris. In any case... You had the ten spheres that metamorphosized or became a physical expression and destroyed Egypt. That's a very important concept. Now, what Moshe Rabbeinu did, which is very interesting, is Moshe Rabbeinu um, destroyed the four creepers. Remember what I said. You see that if a person destroys the sultan by taking away the sparks of holiness, then automatically the Zoyama is destroyed. But we know that there are four levels of Zoyama. If you recall, I went through that. And because there are four levels of Zoyama, then they collapse, you see. Now, the original concept of this is the flood of Noach, if you remember what I said, uh, you know, previously, is that the flood represents, right, the four levels of the Kripa that actually destroyed the world. You see, the measure for measure. And therefore, in the time of Noach, it was the last level, which is the Tahoim, the which is the... Uh, Abyss, the deep sea, that came out and destroyed the world. So it comes out that the 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 creeper itself, you see, was turned uh, against the world because they had created or given rise to that last creeper, the most powerful one of all, which is called the Hoim. <clears throat> Therefore, and this is very interesting. To indicate what Moshe Rabbeinu did, you see, so Moshe Rabbeinu took them to the Yamsuf, and the Yamsuf is called also Tahimus. What does that mean? The Torah is alluding to this: that Moshe, that the, the, the that the world had the flood, and they were drowned in the flood. What Moshe Rabbeinu did is he took the Jews through the Tahim. And he split the sea, which means that he reversed the power of those four states of Tuma, of Soyama, and which means he did the reverse of the flood. The flood destroyed the world, and Yamsuf, which really, again, is the flood, but that flood was reversed, and therefore he took the Jews through the flood, Right? And therefore, that's a reversal of the flood of Noach. That's why there is a Kriyas Yamsuf. It's not an accident, you see. It was meant to indicate that they reversed the flood of Noach, which destroyed the world, you see. And therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu reversed that, or the Jews in Egypt reversed that, and as a result of the reversal, you see, they went through the Yamsuf 
and came out on the other side. And that's, by the way, one of the ideas explains uh, many people gave Moshe Rabbeinu names when he was born. The name that stuck that we use is Moshe because she said, Pare's daughter, Basio, said, Kimin Hamayim Meshisiu, right? From the water I have drawn him. That's the, because that she took uh, Moshe Rabbeinu from the water, the Nile. So therefore, her, her name it refers to, is the name that the Torah uses to, call, to, the, to name Moshe Rabbeinu. But now we understand why her name stuck. Because that was his job. He was, his job was to draw the Jews out of the water. Mishisiru, you see? And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He drew the, the Jewish people out of the water, which means they split the Red Sea, which means they destroyed the Zoyama, all four stages of Zoyama. They destroyed it, it collapsed, you see? And to indicate that, uh, that and this, this is what Moshe Rabbeinu did. So it actually indicates what his job was, you see? And that's why his name is Moshe. From the water I drew him, you see? Because his job is to draw the Jews out of the Zoyama and to destroy the Zoyama, you see, which is really very interesting. So we now understand, uh, and that's why by Ma- Yamsuf it says, use the word Tohimois, which is the abyss, it's the plural, to indicate that it refers to the Tohim of Noyach, the marble, <clears throat> the flood, and it also refers to the undoing of the flood, which is really what Yamsuf is really all about. So that's a very important idea. Also, what's very interesting is that, you know, the marble was Shri Shal Pesach. It was the seventh day of Pesach, uh, or the seventh day when they left Egypt. You see, that's when the uh, Yamsuf happened. And it says that the revelations of, at the Yamsuf was extraordinary that even a maidservant saw more of the depth of the hidden light, the messianic light, you see, than Yecheskel Hanovi saw in his description of the divine chariot, you see. <clears throat> and the question is why? Why is it that at the Yamsuf the Jews had a greater vision, Kabbalistic, mystical, of what really goes on in creation, that even Yechezkel, because his description, Kabbalistically, is foundational, the concept of the divine chariot. And the answer is a very interesting concept, because the whole purpose of the Jew, and that's really what the 49 days are, as we will see, right, <clears throat> is to remove one layer of Zoyama at a time. In other words, in Egypt, what they did is, is they made the Zoyama removable because it was going to collapse. And therefore what they had to do is actually remove every layer of Zoyama. And there are 49 levels of Zoyama, as I will explain, you see. So therefore every day of the 49 days, one level of Zoyama was removed until you got to the 49th level, right, which is they're standing at Mount Sinai, and then all of it was removed, as I said before, that the Gemara says, they were like Odom Arishim before the sin, that they, the Zoya, the Zoya Hamo was externalized outside of their, uh, uh, outside of their body. And therefore, everybody in the Jewish people, even a maidservant, she stood at the Yamsuf, with one-seventh of the Zoyama was removed because it was seven days later when they left Egypt. And the Zoyama began to be removed right after they left Egypt for 49 days. So on the seventh day, right, seven days out of 49 is what? One-seventh. One-seventh of the human body of the Jews had no Zoyama. Automatically, 
the vision that you are granted when you do not have the Zoyama is extraordinary. We cannot even imagine what that is. And that is why in the Messianic era, you see, when the Satan is destroyed and all the, the various stages of evil, right, Kripa, are terminated, we will be granted a vision, divine vision, Kabbalistically and mystically and so on, of the deepest secrets of the creation. And that is the messianic light. Uh, so the messianic light will happen when there's no more Zoyama, basically is when it fully happens. And that is why in Omar of Rio, you see, a woman, a maidservant, was able to see more. Not because she was the greatest scholar, because she had six-sevenths, right, of Zoyama, and one-seventh was removed. So automatically, they began to see unbelievably profound secrets, you see. And therefore, this is what happened. And the truth is that in the removal of the Zoyama, there are stages, you see. So <clears throat> at the end of the uh, Egyptian exile, <clears throat> the Zoyama became removable. And then slowly, in 49 days, it was removed, you see. So like I said, when they stood at Har Sinai, right, it was external to the human body. We don't know what the Jews were when they stood at Sinai because they did not have the Zoyama that we have, you see. They were, actually you can say, they were not even human in that sense. And therefore, their ability to understand the secrets of creation, right, was extraordinary. And really, this already happened after seven days of leaving Egypt. And that's really what the Gemara is saying. The concept that a maidservant saw more uh, than Yechezkel, because the Zoyama had been removed, right? Seven days of Zoyama had been removed. <coughs> And therefore, when they stood at Sinai, right, they were going to enter into the 50, the Zoyam would be removed, and they would enter into the 50 gates. Uh, they would have that vision, you see, and they'd be able to see that, that incredible messianic light. In any case, so we're now getting a real handle, hopefully, of what Egypt really is. Egypt is a, an attempt it's a, a, you can call it the venture of rectifying creation. And it was the first time that it really happened completely. If not for the sin of the golden calf, that restored the Zoyama, which I will talk about and so on. But even then, it's not total. So therefore, Egypt is the forerunner of the Tikkun process, you see. But in order to understand that in the greater depth, I will continue that next week. And we are still in Nisan, so the Shefa of Nisan is continuing to come down, doesn't end, and it will continue to come down basically until Shavuos. Any questions? Okay. Any okay. questions? Yes, I do. I have a couple of them. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the yam soup was a tikkun for the mabul itself? Say that again. What happened at the yam soup? It was a, it was a rectification for, for the mabul? Yeah, it was an undoing. It was a reversal. Because the mambo destroyed the earth, covered everybody. But the Yamsuf was split, which means that the Jews split the sea and went through it and came up to the land. And that symbolically is a reversal of the Yams of the Mabo. Because that's what the Jews had accomplished spiritually. Yes. So don't they say that um, Noah uh, had a spark, or Moshe had a spark of, uh, or was a Gilgul of Noah? 
Yes, and now you understand why. Because right. Noach failed. Noach failed to change the world and get the world to stop sinning. So what the Bansham did is he brought him back, right, to rectify the mistake that he did. You see? So the concept of Moshe being called Meshesihu, I have drawn him from the water, actually is a reference in a certain sense to uh, Noach having to rectify his sin. Right. That's exactly what the Ari says this. You see. So the, the reason why Hashem used water for both of them to do this rectification was because the Jews fell to the level of Tehom? Uh, yes. Right. The Jews were at the level. And that's the concept that the Jews were at the 49th level of Tumor, which is what they were in Egypt and that we know. Okay, they were at so the 49th now, level. Yeah. And that so, is the level of the Tehom, and that was the level of the Mabo. The, the people in the time of the Mabo were at the 49th level, which I once talked about, you know, extensively in a previous year. So we're definitely in the Tehom now. Yes. We so, are in the Tehom, right, which is so a has, terrible place to be, and that is why the redemption is right up ahead. Because the world has to get out of that. It cannot sustain itself in the 49th level of Tumor. And just okay. look around what's happening. Not only in New Jersey, in the entire world, the world is filled with all kinds of, you know, corruption and evil and so on. Yeah, go ahead. So if we already made the rectific rectification on the water by splitting it, on the Tehom, then yes. we need to do that again, but it was already done. Did the, did the Chetra Egel re reverse it? Yes. The Chetra Egel restored the Zoyama, but not completely, which I'm going to talk about uh, probably next week. It restored it, but like I say, not completely, and we still have to remove the Tehom. Because, like I said, it you know it was restored. To the 49th level. What was that? The Cheta Ego dropped us back down to the 49th level. Well, in a certain sense, yes, but it wasn't as bad. The Jews did not go back totally. In other words, they went 49th level. But the question is, how much in each level is the quantity? So you may be at the 49th level, but it's not as severe let's say on a scale of 1 to 10. So the 49th level could be 10 or it could be 4, you see? So there is a degree of quantity, even in the 49th level. But there's no question that the uh, Jewish people are now at the 49th level. I mean, just take a look at the, uh, the incredible opposition to religion in Israel and the Amorat, the Amhoratsus, the incredible ignorance of Jews throughout the world it's just beyond belief that uh, almost for the first time in history you know Jewish people <clears throat> have almost no connection to their Torah you know I mean there is a group obviously uh, the religious and there's a lot of learning going on but I gave a shir when I talked about Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky the difference you know that they, they may learn a lot but there's not they don't know this is a great problem <coughs> but in any case, we are certainly at the 49th level of evil. <coughs> you see. So then Hashem needs to do something with the water again for us to make that rectification? Well, you know, that's, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting idea. So, I mean, the problem is that, remember, you know, in those days by Egypt, it was one country. And all the Jews were in that one country. So basically, it would mean, right, that the Jews have to leave that country. But the problem today is that the Jews are all over the planet. You see? So, uh, it, it, it's not, the Tehoim is not going to be a place of water. 
Because what are they gonna, what, what's the bunch I'm going to do? Split the Atlantic Ocean? The Jews are all over the world. So what would that gain? You see? The real thing is you have to gather all the Jews. You know what I mean? Hello? Yeah, so, so, you, don't, so you, don't, you don't know. Obviously, we don't know how. But it, we don't. No, we don't. We don't know how the Rabban Shem is going to do that. It doesn't say, it? like Ramcha doesn't talk about how the Tehom has to, <clears throat> is intertwined with our generation now and how it would happen. No. No, he talks about it in very general terms. But the exact description, as they call it, blow-by-blow blow description, of what will happen, nobody really knows. It's like the Rambam writes that we don't really know a great deal of how the goal of the redemption will happen is hidden from us. All we know is that it will happen, and in general terms, we can have an understanding, like I mentioned, with the windows and the gates and so on, you know. But how you redeem the Jews when the Jews are all over the world and that the Jews are in the Memteshari Tumah, right? And the world is in the Memteshari Tumah. The world itself is steeped in tremendous amount of evil. Nobody really knows how it's going to happen, you see. Uh, except uh, uh, there are general terms, you see. <clears throat> I, I have uh, spoken about this you know, extensively, what I think is going to happen, you see. <clears throat> and I believe what's going to happen, I, I bring the Tzapasik down in its oven, where God says, I am going to gather, even if you are outcast, be at the ends of heaven, right? From there, Misham, I will gather you, Yikabetzcha, which means that God will go into the, 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 the creeper, the nation of evil, Right? He's going to go into all of that and pull the Jews out. And then it says that he's going to bring them, right? And he's going to bring the Jews to God, which means that he's going to teach them the Torah. Because God is not going to bring a Mashiach to a nation that is steeped in tumor. It's an incredible embarrassment, you see. Now, we don't know how that's going to be either, you see. And then he's going to bring them to Eretz Yisrael. In fact, next week I'm going to talk about the, uh, why there are four cups, right? But really, what the, uh, the four expressions of redemption, which parallels the four cups, and how those four levels, or five actually, because there are five expressions of redemption, actually mirrors what's going to happen today, right? Because Egypt is a model of the redemption itself, the process. And therefore, what happened in Egypt it's going to happen now, you see? But, so really, like I say, you know, it's going to happen, but we don't know exactly how. I suspect that the, the Beis Hamikdash, the third temple, which the Gemara clearly says will come down before Mashiach ben David, which is in, astounding, right? That somehow that will play a part in gathering the Jews. In other words, it could happen that all of a sudden, there's a third temple, right? And with all its glory, that is sitting on the Harabais. What would the world think? I mean, the world will go crazy. It will be front page news in every uh, social site in the world. I mean, it's incredible. And the whole world would change as a result of that. And I'm sure all the Jews will now seek God, because once they see the third temple, and that third temple isn't just a temple, it's going to be filled with miracles, you know, who's not going to want to go to Israel to see that temple? Look, there's going to be a massive shake-up of this world, but the exact details of that is unknown. And, and they say that the, 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 the seas are going to split again, is that true? Well, that's this idea. What, what, what does it mean that the sea splits? If the Jews are all around the world, what does it mean the seas are going to split? Right. You know? So that's not clear. How is Yamsov going to be, uh, you know, uh, duplicated right. again? 
like I say, in those days it was Egypt, so you could have a split. You could split the the, the uh, sea. Uh, but today the Jews are all over the world. Oh, so what's the Russians going to do? Split all the oceans? Not likely. So it's not clear how that will manifest the uh, the uh, the uh, reversal of the Memteshari Toma. But there will be something that does mirror that, you know, and so on. As as we reverse the Memte uh, Memte uh, of Tuma, we go yes. we go through the levels of the the, the klipot of the of the Satan. Uh, so yes, like because all of to, and then you go yeah. up to the every right. every level you go backwards, then Hoshin, yes. then Boho, then Toho. Yes, because you have to remember the manifestation of the Zoyama are those four levels. That's how it comes out into the world. So therefore, if the Zoyama is collapsing, those four levels will collapse. You see? So do we know how Moshe did it? Like do we what know what? Tohu? Do we know how Moshe did it? Like, what, what, what parallels Tohu? What parallels Bohu? Like, how did Moshe reverse those? <clears throat> no, we don't really know. No. The, the four stages of redemption, the four stages of uh, satanic environment will collapse. But that's automatic once the Zoyama is gone and then the Sultan is destroyed. And this is you all see. the job of the, of the Mashiach Ben Yosef, to reverse the... the, well, the, the actual dis- well, the actual destruction of the Sultan is the job of Mashiach Ben David. So he does the last, the last one. Yes. He will destroy evil and change the world into a physical world that is a manifestation of unbelievable holiness. In other words, we're going to uh, enter Gan Eden. This world in the Messianic era, Mashiach ben David, is really Gan Eden. That's really what it is. It has no Zoyama, even though it's a physical universe, you know, but it will be so encompassed by Kedusha that, you know, I don't know if you can call it physical. It's certainly not going to be physical the way we see it now, because this universe is filled with satanic Zoyama. What a physical universe looks like without Zoyama is unknown to us. And the parallel to that is Gan Eden, the Gan Eden of Adam Marishim. That was the only time the world has ever been devoid of the Zoyama, except by Martin Torah. So that was a Gan Eden. See? So when we so go that, from the physical to the spiritual, what does that spiritual level consist of? I know it's the world of the angels. But yes. if it's not the Messianic era, and it's not Olam Haba, what is it technically? And also, what happens to the angels once we get to their level? Do they disappear? <clears throat> Do they diminish? No. No, Malachim remain. But they what's remain. Their job? What? What's their job their, if we come their up to job, their, their job will be to do whatever you want. Really? Yeah. You're going to have a huge entourage of angels waiting to serve you. But in, in what way can they serve us if we're so spiritual in, in our beings? Because we are not familiar with the spiritual universe. We don't know what goes on there. We don't know the needs, you know, the phenomenon, or I should say the phenomena. We don't know. Look, they have a universe. The Malachim in Oilem Yitzira and Oilem Bria, wherever, you know, they live in, a, they actually live in some type of creation. You know, we don't know what that is. They actually have, you know, you can call it a world an environment, a residence, we don't know. But they have rules. There are rules and regulations that govern the world of angels. You see? That's all part of Kabbalah. But we don't really know what it is because we don't know the type of nature that beings have in that plane. 
You see? Look, we don't even understand what Gan Eden is. Where there's no Zoyama. There's no Satan. We don't know what that is. You know, that means if we did, that means we would be like Odom Mauritian before the sin. Because he knew what that was. He lived in it. But we have no idea what, what type of environment he lived in at all. So we are so far removed from that type of existence. So for the existence of Oilem Yitzira or Bria or whatever is completely unknown to us, you see. And Oilem Haba is completely not only, uh, uh, it's not even knowable right now. God has to give us a whole different set of lenses to understand what the future world is, you see. Because the spiritual world of angels is infinitely inferior to Ilam Habo, you see. And we, don't, we have no idea what the Ghanaian is. We don't know what the, uh, the uh, world of angels are. We don't know what the type of world certainly is, Ilam Habo. All of this lies ahead. You see, all of this lies ahead. So do the angels look forward to uh, this process as much as we do? Like, do they look forward to the point where we go up to their level and they serve us? Is that their goal like our goal is? Uh, That's an interesting question when you say do they look forward. What they do look forward to is that the concealment of God's presence is over. That's true, because there also is a, is a certain measure. I wouldn't use the word pain, but whenever God is concealed, there is a measure of disappointment. It's hard to say what it is, you know. So in that sense, yeah, you know, that's why I mentioned, I think, two weeks ago, you know, the concept that there was this applause for this relief picture, they're going to be screaming at the top of their lungs. Angels. The trillions of them. Why? Because it's not, it's not their well-being. Because they all want God to be realized and acknowledged for who He really is. Like it says, You know, He will be a king of the earth. On that day, He and His name will be one. Really, those in the know, which certainly are the angels, they all look forward to that type of reality where God is completely, at that level anyway, revealed. It will be absolutely astounding. So in that sense, yes, they look forward to it. You know, uh, and, and, and that's all they need. You know, when God reveals himself, there's an unbelievable joy that creation will have. We don't know what that means. You know, I, I remember <clears throat> many years ago, it was about 20 years ago, Romania had a dictator. He was terrible. His name was Cochesco. You know, that was his name, if you recall. He was a dictator of Romania. The guy was in the process of destroying Romania by removing everything around, whatever. So I remember... <clears throat> I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was 20 years ago, you know, where they, the Romanian people threw him out. You know, they were able to, you know, capture him and over, 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 uh, overrule him and subdue him and so on, you know. And I remember they were playing this at that time that it was happening when they captured uh, Cochesco. And they killed him, by the way, right? Um, they captured him and so on, you know. And they were, it was on the radio, I remember. And all of a sudden, I think when he died, or when they captured him, I don't recall which moment it was, there was a screaming of joy that you can't believe what these Romanians were doing. It was just incredible to listen to the unmitigated, extraordinary expression of such simcha. It's incredible. Why? Because they finally had gotten rid of 
a terrible, terrible person, you see. So that itself is a cause of unbelievable joy, you see. So you could you imagine in our lives what that's going to be when it's not just a guy like Kuchesko, right? When it's going to be the Sultan and his entire entourage, kingdom. It's called the Sitra Akhra, right? The side of, of uh, the other side. When that will be destroyed for eternity, could you believe the joy? Because the Sultan and all his minions, they are responsible for untold sadness, misery, right? Depression and pain and suffering. Could you imagine when that is gone for eternity? So we will yet witness that. We will yet witness the simcha of the entire creation when the Sultan is destroyed. You see. Okay, I have another question. So yes. when you were speaking about Yosef, you were saying how when um, he resisted the temptation of Potiphar's wife, um, yes. he was able to restore the sparks of holiness in that place in Egypt. Yes. So my question is, is that sometimes we find ourselves in places where we wouldn't normally want to be or find or, or you know, in random places. And let's say we do, as, people, as Jews, resist temptations in any way, shape, or form. Is Hashem placing us in those places to remove those sparks of <coughs> holiness in order to, you know, for the tikkun process? Like, do we have that ability as or, or average, ordinary Jews? Yes. Every Jew is assigned his portion in terms of removing the sparks of holiness from the sudden. Every Jew has his portion. <clears throat> and when a Jew resists temptation of sinning, you know, then he actually transfers those sparks to the side of holiness. So the answer is yes. The difference between us and Yosef at Tzadik is Yosef had the neshama. He had the soul of an almost, it's called a chatzi of. He was half a patriarch. So he had this, it's like Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, but a smaller version. So he had this incredible capacity that if he would resist, there was an enormous transfer of sparks. Because the greater his neshama, then the greater the effect of his resisting temptation is. So when he did that, and actually I'm going to talk about that later when I talk about Esau, and Yosef at Tzaddik and so on, what the real temptation was, and so on, was extraordinary. It's, not, it's nothing that we can imagine. And that's why he was rewarded to be, you know, that's why he was... He, could you imagine a guy going from prison, which is the lowest social class in Egypt, and the next day, it wasn't even... It was on the same day. The Pusik that describes Yosef is one Pusik. They, they took him out, they bathed him, clothed him, and he stood in front of Paroi. Right? This all happened within three hours. So in three hours, he went from being the lowest social class of Egypt to Grand Vizier. So could you imagine the amount of Nitzitis that he took out of Egypt? And the greatest proof is the, is the famine. You know, that famine really symbolically, was the famine that the Sultan had because he had so few Nitzitis left. You see? And he did that. That's the difference between him and us. But we all have that ability, each on our own level, and our own assignment. You see? We have so that. So would, would um, our personal tikkun correlate to really... Uh, us completing of taking out the holy sparks that we needed to in our lifetime. Yes. And restoring it to the side of the spheres. Then eventually, all of that will be lowered or projected into this world. 
and change the world. That's really what, what it's all about, which I had talked about previously and so on. Yes, that's really our job. That was the agreement of the Brisbane Absalom, the covenant or the agreement that God made with Avram Avino at Har Sinai, excuse me, at the wherever it was uh, and so on, you see. That's our job. Our job, we, you know what we really are? We are repairmen. Or as they say today, we are repair people or persons, right? <clears throat> we have to repair the existential state of creation. Right now it is a state that's terrible. God is concealed, right? There's Zoyama all over the place, and mankind keeps doing evil. It's a terrible place. You see, our job is to change it. Change it back into its pristine glory, which is the time of other Mauritian before the sin. And that's the Messianic era. But that's not even our job. That's really our job. But then after that, God takes over. And he's the one who advances the process, where it now goes from a physical universe to a spiritual. So we really only have, if you think about it, only a small measure of that process. That's all we have. You know, and even that's so tough. Is to change, is to get rid of the Zoyama, right? And that's it. That is our process to come back to the level of Oda Mauritian before the sin. After that, God does the rest. So our job is to initiate, is to start, you know, the ongoing process of change. And each one of us has that job. You see? Anybody who is Jewish has that job. They are now given whatever assignment they have to do, even if they become, if they become Gerim, you know, and so on, you know. But we all have that job, right? So, so you know, you always say how um, once um, the Mashiach comes and we get m- uh, more clarity on the revelation of like the hu- of the creation and we get more Toda secrets, all that, and it goes yes. according. Every person goes according <clears throat> to their merits of how much they're going to be able to see and the, and their closeness to God. Did that happen at the Yamsu? Like you said, like the maid servants were able to see uh, as much as Yehezkel. <clears throat> did they have yes. levels at that yeah, what's time the, as well? Yeah, what's important to know is that knowing the secrets of God is not an intellectual experience. It's an experience of emotion. It means the idea is now wrapped together with its feeling. It's not that you know something. You know something, right? And you feel something with the information. It's like a simultaneous joy with a concept together, which happens to us every once in a while. All of a sudden, you're struggling with something, and all of a sudden, you realize what the answer is. And that is associated together with tremendous happiness. So that's really what you experience. It's not just an intellectual idea. You know something. No. You experience it, both an idea and also in the world of feelings. You see. So everyone will get different levels of feelings? Exactly. Depending on the level of of knowledge. Yes. Depending on the level of knowledge that you will be privy to. Yes. And each one is given based on how much he accomplished. You see. But there is a minimal level. You see. There is a level that everybody will experience by the mere fact that he is on a much higher level. There's what's called the minimum. And then within that minimum, there's the extra measure that you get because of your avoider, because of your service, you see. Is it that's, why it's so, that's why it's so important in, while we're all alive to strive for excellence in the avoider, because... We want to have as much as God is giving. You don't want to shortchange yourself. 
you see. So is it possible to get little snippets of that feeling in this lifetime? Yes, it is. It is. If you do the Avoida right, if you learn Torah right, you can experience it. Yes. God has opened up the door that we can experience these things at a, obviously a very small level. But it is possible to experience. Look, even Shabbos is an experience of the divine, which we feel when Shabbos enters. You know? But the problem is that we are so immersed in the 49 levels of Tumor that that blocks us, you see. It's a tremendous blockage. Look, there's a great deal to talk about that, you know. It's unfortunate that many people today, you could have that if you would know how to observe a Yom Tov correctly, what it's about, what spiritual things happened on that Yom Tov, you see, and how to, you know, think about God in, in during that Yom Tov. <clears throat> the problem is that, you know, the Jews have relegated themselves to experiencing a yontif in a minimal way. You know, you basically sleep and you eat, you go to shul, but in, in many ways it's become perfunctory. <clears throat> you know, just, we do it, we go through the motions, you see. But do we really experience that holiday? And the joy that that holiday should do it, you can only do that if you learn about the holiday. And the problem is that people really don't le learn about the holidays except in a very superficial way. <clears throat> you know, everybody is so, is so into the halachas, which of course is very important. But in really, in order to experience the joy the avoida of that holiday, you must learn the hashkofa. The greater your understanding of hashkofa, of that day, the greater will be your enjoyment. You see. And the problem is that's not really taught. You but see. How do you, how do you navigate, uh, you know, when you see so many people not tapping into it and then like, Sometimes, like, I, I see it, let's say, and then I'll feel bad for them, like, later on, when, when Hashem does reveal Himself, that they will get only that minimum of it. Like, how do you <clears throat> navigate that? Because you probably, as you knew this information for so long, and you see it always. So uh, how, do you, how do you, like, what to do? Like, I guess I pray for them, I send them love, and I try to, like, send that energy to them. But, like, besides for that, what else? could a person do to help <coughs> Well, look, at that, so, you know, the, I mean, the idea of that, the real idea of that is that, you know, that's why I, I give these hash coffee sure. You know, I want people to realize what they're missing. Where are they going to get it? They're not going to get it. Most people, uh, even if they hear some hash coffee, it's more of a sermon than it is a idea, a knowledge. You know, uh, that's part of the problem, you know, uh, is to teach people the facts, the information, the knowledge of what these things are, you know, and that's really the only way. Is that as a long part as people, of the satan? What? Is that a part of the satan's hold on us? Like oh, yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. He doesn't want anybody experiencing the real spiritual joy of a holiday. He doesn't want that. Sure. So what he does, <clears throat> his major way of making sure you won't, is he gets you in love with your business. That becomes your reason, as they say in French, you know, raison d'etre. Your reason for being becomes your business. You know, what it is, how much money you're making, and so on. You begin talking about physical topics you know, mundane topics, and you're enamored of that. So if that's on your conscious mind, so how are you going to, you know, get involved in the Avedah? 
They are very the spiritual. It's a whole different framework of creation. So it's very hard. Look, people make that choice. You know, they're in, they are heavy into the physical world. And the Satan, of course, is in charge of that. And that's what he wants. But you know. I think it's beyond people's choice. I think a lot of people, are, they don't even see it. They don't even see it, like zero. They don't see yeah. themselves making that choice. They yes, don't even know they have right. a choice. <clears throat> right. But that's, a, that's also satanic. Because what the Satan does, you know, it says, we are hastir astir ponai bayomahu. You know, it says, and God says, I will surely hide my face in that day. So there's, the question is, there's a, a double expression of concealment. So there are different interpretations, you know. Unfortunately, you know, one of the interpretations, right, is not only will be God be hidden. I mean, the, he once said this, the, the Biana River, Motro Shlomo Friedman, he once said something, which is very true. He says, you know, you think, you know, that I have the kiloi of the ore. No, it's concealed from me. You see, so therefore that double expression means not only will it be hidden from the average Jew, it's hidden from the Gedolim. It's hidden from the Rebbes. That's what he was alluding to, you see. So that's satanic, that even they miss the boat. Not totally, obviously, but even they are mistaken in many ways, you know. And like I said, one of the mistakes that is made is people don't learn the spirituality of the holidays. Yeah, they learn about, uh, you know, the halachas, they learn about the event. But what takes place spiritually, really? What's the tikkun all about, you see? Very few people are familiar with these ideas. Because this is not taught. I'm not saying that people should learn Kabbalah, which actually is not a bad idea. But certainly they should learn the depth of Hashkofa, and that's brought down in Ramchal, in Ram Moshechayim Mutzatoy. And then a person has to meditate on that, what he's learning, not just read it, but has to think about that. What does this really mean? What does it mean in terms of my life? Well, how can I meet that goal? You see, this isn't done. There's a tremendous emphasis, you know, on the storyline which is very important, true. There's a tremendous emphasis on the halachas, which again is very important, very true. But there's hardly anything placed on the real spiritual depth of each holiday, you know. Look, I once gave a shir about what Shabbos is. Most people have no idea what Shabbos is. Yeah, they think it's a day of rest and so on, the obvious. <clears throat> but what it really is, the opening of Olim Yitzira, so you can feel it, they don't know. It's the whole shir. This is a mistake that people make. They should really learn Hashkafa, you see, in the yeshivas, and to try to understand what is Judaism, who is God, why does the world look the way it does, how does somebody evade or get to a high spiritual level, you see, that's why the Ramchal wrote Mesila Sishoram, right? How to do the Avoida. He wrote also Derech Chochma, how to learn, what to learn. And then he wrote Derech Hashem, Das Funes. It's amazing, Ramchal wrote Sforam on all these topics because he saw it as critical to fulfill your mission. You see. So therefore we remain in our ignorance and that's the problem. So, is it is the, you know the whole concept? Oh, you shouldn't learn Kabbalah until you're forty, and women shouldn't learn it at all, and all those sayings. Were they really uh, the Satan's like, uh, you know, not uh, uh, a part of his mission, so that it would stop and it wouldn't spread, and that light wouldn't be right. revealed? Yes, right. But there's a great deal to say about that 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 prohibition of learning Kabbalah, unless you are f familiar totally with the entire Torah, that period is over. I mean, you have many Gedolim who say, that's over, the Vilna Goyen. 
of Chaim Vital and so on. Today it's permitted to delve into these areas. You know, I mean, what's the alternative? Is it better to delve into the areas of, of other Chochmas, science, and to leave the depths of creation? Is it better to leave that? To what? To other people? Jews need everything they can get to save themselves. You know, this is the problem. We are really in the middle of the ocean. And the problem is, not only are we in the middle of the ocean, you see, but we don't have a life raft. Or we do have a life raft, you see, and this is the problem, you see. In any case, um, yeah. Um, Rachel wants to know about what you think about all the destruction that they were doing in the Har Habayi over the holiday. The well, like I said, you know, as we get closer and closer, you know, as we get closer and closer, uh, we wonder what's, uh, you know, there are barometers that indicate that the Klippa, the Sutton, is trying to engage more and more in opposition because he realizes his days are numbered, you see. So that's like I mentioned by Kevin Yosef. That's really what's going on, you know. But, but they're destroying their own holy site. So it's like they're fighting themselves. Yeah, well, that's what the Arabs always do. They always shoot themselves in the leg. Right. You know. But how was Hashem letting anyway. Him How is what? She she says, how does Hashem allow that to happen where Yosef HaSadiq is resting? No, and also where Hashem rests. Oh, where Hashem Har-Habayit. rests are on the Har Habayit. That's Kodesh HaKodeshim, really. Because he justifies the Sutton by Kitrugim. He's able to justify it in a court, in heaven, that he has a right to do this because the Jews are sinning. That's, that's how he always gets his way, you see. You know what I mean? Anyway, because it's not, he doesn't have any power. We give him the power. His power comes completely from the Jewish people, from nothing else. And that's what he's hoping. That's the whole concept of sparks of holiness. When we sin, we give him those sparks. And that's his power, you see. So in that sense, we give him his power. He doesn't have an independent power. You see? 